developed from the earlier P-36 Hawk designed by the Curtis Aviation Company, the improved P-40 Warhawk saw combat service with a number of nations during the Second World War. One such unit that flew these aircraft was that of the American Volunteer Group flying for the Chinese Air Force against the Japanese. This unit earned the nickname the Flying Tigers, due to the teeth painted on the noses of their aircraft and the news reports of their ferocious combat missions against the enemy. Hello everyone, Matt from Model Minutes here, and welcome back to the workbench as I build and review the 172nd scale plastic model kit of the Curtis Hawk 81A2 from Airfix. For a more in-depth look at the contents of the box, including the sprues and decal sheets, take a look at the unboxing video I made on that particular subject. In this video though, I'll be focusing on how well it builds up and the overall quality of the product. I'll pop a list of the products I used during the build on screen now to give you an idea of the kind of paints and things you might need to go and get if you want to have a go at doing this one yourself. As always, please remember that model building can be hazardous due to the use of sharp tools and toxic paints and chemicals. Airfix recommends this kit to those aged eight years and over. So without further ado, let's get into it. First up, I'm going to start removing various parts from the sprues. I'm using my knife here, but at other times I will use my cutters. Any excess plastic, rough areas or flash will be carefully removed using a sanding stick. I'm using Tamiya Extra Thin Cement to glue the cockpit floor into the mounting slots on the lower wing part. This is a great product, as it will flow into the gaps between parts and give a good bond. I then add the control column into its hole. This is followed by the pilot's chair, which again has a slot it pushes into. The control panel can then be glued into place here. With that done, it's time to get some painting on the way. I'm going to use this Vallejo Buff Acrylic and mix it with a small amount of US Light Green Model Air paint. This will create more of a yellow cockpit green as often used on this kind of aircraft. I pretty much mixed this paint by eye until I got the color I was looking for. So not sure of the exact ratios used, but if I had to guess, I'd say it was about even parts. A little X20A Tamiya acrylic thinner was added to the pot to help it flow and mix better. I loaded it into my airbrush and then proceeded to spray it onto all the internal areas of the model. This included the cockpit and wheel wells. Whilst that paint was drying, I moved on to paint the pilot. Tamiya XF15 flat flesh acrylic was painted onto the face of the figure. Humbrol 110 natural wood was then used to paint the overall flight suit of the pilot. I then mixed up a combination of the brown, green and buff to get a slightly darker jacket colour for the figure. This was then painted onto the upper torso of the pilot as well as his flying helmet. Vallejo aluminium was carefully placed onto the lenses of his goggles. With the paint now dry, my homemade enamel wash was brushed onto the figure to help bring out those details and dull down the contrast between the paints. For more information on how to make this wash, check out my tutorial on this topic. I thinned some Humbrol 33 matte black with Tamiya acrylic thinner and then brushed it onto the control panel and the handle of the control stick. A few layers of this paint would be needed to get a good finish. A decal for the control panel is included, so when the paint was dry, I soaked the decal in warm water and applied it to the model. I used some Humbrol decal fix here to help it stick to the surface of the paint and soften into the plastic. I'll go into more depth about decals later in the build. I scraped some paint from the pilot's chair, added some cement, and then popped the pilot in place. The instructions actually ask you to do this at the end of the build, on almost the last step, which I think is a bit late and would probably be a little hard and fiddly, which is why I added him here. 
the two fuselage halves can then be cemented together. They actually fit really well with minimal fuss, but some pressure might be needed to hold them in place until the glue dries. Fuselage is popped on top of the cockpit area on the lower wing part and then glued into place. When that's done, the two upper wing halves can also be added to the model. There is a slight gap at the root of the wings, but it won't be so noticeable later after some painting. The nose intake is cemented into place on the front of the model. This was followed by gluing on the top of the nose with the machine guns. The rudder was then added to the model. The horizontal tail surfaces are glued into slots in the tail. Pilot's headrest can then be cemented into its slot in the cockpit. I used Humbrol 110 natural wood acrylic to paint this part. The engine exhaust cowling comes with either an option for open or closed. I chose to use the open version and glued it onto the model. Different parts are included to display the wheels raised or lowered. Later, I will display the model with the landing gear lowered. But, for now, I will use the parts included for the raised landing gear, pushing them into place so they act as a mask for the painting stages. And speaking of painting, let's get some on the model. I started off with the lightest colour, which is the Vallejo Model Air Curtis Grey. When the real aircraft were built in the Curtis factory, they painted them in similar colours that the Royal Air Force were using for their camouflage, but it's not quite a perfect match, being ever so slightly different. Apparently, these aircraft were meant to be delivered to the RAF, but were diverted to China instead. I applied a few thin layers of this paint to the lower side of the model using my airbrush. I was able to buy some specific paint colours for this build thanks to the generous support of my patrons on Patreon and channel members on YouTube. A massive thanks to these guys on screen for their extra support, and particularly to my latest member Matthew who joins the intermediate tier on Patreon. Take a look at the links in the description to find out more. Shameless plug out of the way, let's get back to the video. Whilst that grey paint is drying, I assembled the propeller components. The propeller is glued to the back plate and then the spinner added over the top. Now it's time for the next layer of paint. I've gone for the Vallejo US Air Force Brown, which again will be airbrushed on. You'll be able to notice that I've used some sponge and tape to mask the cockpit area. I needed to apply a few layers of this paint as it seemed to be quite thin but eventually it was completed. When it was dry, I decided to mask the brown areas I wanted to keep by brushing on some Vallejo liquid mask fluid. I followed the painting instructions on the box to do this, then left this mask to dry. I used Vallejo US Forest Green for the next color, again applying a few thin layers until I had the desired coverage. When it was dry, it was time to remove the liquid mask and tape. I did this carefully by gently rubbing it away with a wooden tool, then using my finger to remove the rest. Whilst this is a great masking fluid and it does work effectively at protecting the paint underneath, I found that there was a little bleed in places, but ultimately it didn't leave a neat edge between the colours. It had started to flake off with a rough or fuzzy segregation between these colours and it just generally looked pretty bad in my opinion. Lesson learned. Let's see if I can fix it. I thought the quickest way to try and solve the problem would be to mask the grey undersides with tape again, then respray the model with the brown paint. I did this until the green was completely covered. When it was dry, I decided that this time I would make some worms out of white tack instead. I could have used the blue stuff, but I only had the white stuff available. I stuck these worms onto the model following the contours of the camouflage pattern from the instructions pressing them down firmly so they would not come off. I then used the liquid mask again to fill in the areas that needed protection. It's my first time ever using this method, so I hope it works out okay. Whilst the liquid mask is drying, I used this time to also mask the canopy parts. I used my standard method of sticking the tape on, then cutting away the excess of a sharp knife. I used the canopy frames as a guide, but this was quite a time-consuming stage. 
Airfix doesn't actually include the option to display the canopy open on this kit, so if you wanted to do that it would require some modification of these parts or scratch building some new ones. Let's get that green paint back on the model now. Again, a few thin layers of this paint were applied to both the plain and the clear parts until I'd got the coverage I was looking for. And when it was dry, the moment of truth. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with these results. The masking fluid and white tack worms have done a good job. The segregation between paint colours is a little soft in places, but it's something I can live with and work on in a future build. I then used PVA glue to stick the cockpit canopy components onto the model. I'm leaving the masking tape on these parts for now, but will remove them closer to the end of the build. Fortunately, the fit of these parts is really good, and the glue will dry clear so you won't see it at the end. With those parts glued in place, I sprayed the entire model with this K-Colors Clear Gloss Acrylic. I've been quite impressed with this airbrush ready varnish, but it is a little hard to get in the shop. I might have to find an alternative soon as I'm starting to run out. This varnish will protect the previous paint layers and act as a smooth surface for the decals to be applied to soon. It should also prevent the decal carrier film from silvering when they are applied. As the gloss was drying, I moved on to using this Vallejo Matte Black acrylic, which I mixed with a small amount of the K-Colors gloss varnish to give it a slightly satin sheen. I used this on the blades of the propeller, the spinner having been painted brown previously when I was using that color on the aircraft. And now, it's decal time. I cut the sheet into more manageable sections, then selected the transfers I wanted to apply and soaked them in warm water to release them from the backing paper. As usual, I'm going to use Micro Scale, Set and Sol as my setting solutions in this build. They aren't as aggressive as the Humbrol decal fix I used earlier and dry without leaving any residue. I brush micro set, which is in the blue bottle, onto the areas the decals are going to be placed. I then carefully position the decals. The micro set should help soften the transfer into the surface details, helping it stick in place. I'll then apply micro sol from the red bottle on the top to increase the softening effect and make them look as though they are painted on. These decals being made by Cartograph are absolutely brilliant, possibly my favourite type of transfers from any manufacturer. The colours are good, the printing is great, and they don't have much carrier film around the edges. They can be a little thin and fiddly at times, but with careful hands you shouldn't have any problems. With that done, I added the wheel hubs into the centres of the wheels. I've already painted the tyres with the black paint I used earlier, and stuck the decals that were included onto the hubs. I simply applied a little cement and pressed them into place. It was quite a tight fit though. With all the decals now in place and completely cured, the gloss varnish can once again be sprayed onto the model to further protect those decals and create a surface suitable for a little weathering. And speaking of weathering, when the gloss was dry, I used my homemade panel wash to pick out the recessed details. I do have a tutorial on this particular wash on my channel, but to give you a hint, it's just enamel paint on white spirit. I made a really thin solution of this wash so that the panels had a subtle look to them. Excess wash was then carefully removed using a cotton bud dipped in a little white spirit. I try and do this in the direction of airflow over the aircraft to add a little more of a weathered effect, as if oil is streaking down the plane. When that wash was completely dry, I used Humbrol 49 Matte Varnish Acrylic, which I thinned with some hot water in my airbrush until it had the consistency of milk. It wouldn't be a modelling video if someone didn't say something like that about the thickness of paint, right? Mixing it with hot water should help avoid leaving a white residue that this product can often leave. I also sprayed it in thin coats to minimise this. With that done, I removed the raised landing gear, which had been protecting the paint in those areas. I'm going to use Vallejo Aluminium to paint the actual landing gear components I'm going to use. I sprayed the legs and the engine exhaust with this particular paint. I used some Revell contactor cement to add some blobs of glue into the slots for the landing gear legs, and I then popped the legs into place. I'd repeat the process on the tail of the aircraft for the landing gear housing. The tail wheel, which has already been painted, was glued into the slot here. 
Returning to the main landing gear, the wheels were then added onto their respective legs. This was then followed by gluing the landing gear covers into place. This can be a little fiddly due to the small parts. With that done, I used Humbrol 53 gunmetal acrylic to carefully paint the barrels of the machine guns in the wings and nose of the model. The engine exhausts can now be carefully glued into the slots on the sides of the nose. I used Humbrol 24 matte yellow on the tips of the propeller blades. The Vallejo aluminium paint then made a reappearance. I used this to carefully simulate chipped paints in various areas of the model, particularly around walkways and any other areas that might have seen use. I paid attention to the panels around moving parts or those that might have been removed regularly for inspection or maintenance. A fine brush was used to carefully dab this paint on. I scraped off some dust from a black soft pastel and then very carefully used this to simulate staining in various areas of the model. This includes the barrel of the guns and engine exhausts. A fine dry brush would apply the dust to the model and a larger clean brush used to remove the excess. There is one small clear part still left to add, a landing light in one of the wings. I already painted the area with aluminium and used a small amount of PVA glue to hold it in place. I pushed the propeller assembly into the hole in the nose. The option to make this spin freely is included, but it would need to be added much earlier in the build when the fuselage halves are joined together. The final step was to carefully remove the masking tape on the cockpit canopy, and with that, my build of the Airfix Curtis Hawk in 172nd scale is now complete. Before I get into the review of this model and some of the stats, let's take a quick look at the history of the aircraft. For this, I'd like to welcome Hamish's Heinkels, another modelling YouTuber, so over to you. The Curtis P-40 was an American Second World War fighter plane that was used in many different countries during the Second World War. Its nicknames the Warhawk, Tomahawk and Kitty Hawk were all used for different variants of the aircraft. It was notably used in North Africa, the Southwest Pacific and China. The P-40 was an all-metal, single-engine and single-seater fighter that was used by the Allies during the Second World War. This particular variant was used by the Chinese and was part of the formidable Flying Tigers. The Flying Tigers were made up from the 1st American Volunteer Group, a group of Americans operating under the Chinese colours but were flying under American control. They were tasked with bombing Japan and defending the Republic of China. Their aircraft were neat because they had a cartoon tiger painted on the side, as well as a shark's face on the nose inspired by the RAF P-40s in North Africa. Thanks so much for that interesting segment, and if you'd like to check out the Hamish's Heinkels channel for his modelling videos, there will be a link in the description. But anyways, back to the review of this kit. Now, I have to confess that I do have a bit of a thing for this particular tooling of the P-40 from Airfix. Not sure why, but I seem to really enjoy it, which over the last five years or so has resulted in me building not one, not two, but four of these kits now. Granted, the other versions all had different paint schemes, but the toolings are exactly the same. So why do I keep coming back to this kit? Well, the instructions are easy to follow, and those colour painting and decal placement guides are really nice too. The decals, as previously mentioned, are some of the best that I've ever applied to a model, and I think it shows as there is no silvering, and even those slightly complicated transfers through the shark's mouth on the nose have conformed really well. The plastic parts, though, are moulded to a good quality, with only a hint of flash, and they all fit together really well, with only a small amount of sanding needed. I didn't use any filler on this model, and those perfectionists out there might want to use some in a few places here and there, but personally, I can't see any big gaps or seams that really needed it. It is a bit of a shame that the cockpit canopy can't be displayed open to give a better view of the cockpit and pilot, and having those clear parts extend part way down the fuselage could provide a bit of a challenge for a beginner if they forgot to paint those areas before gluing them in. Other than that though, the build is fairly easy, and I would be tempted to agree with Airfix that this is pretty much a skill level 1 and suitable for those starting out in the hobby. 
The decals and paint scheme might provide a bit of a challenge if it's your first ever kit, but if you've got a little experience this should prove to be quite a rewarding build. The kit on the whole seems to be a fairly accurate uh, representation of the real life P40, but it does not quite have the same level of detail as models from other brands. Personally I would like to see some more rivets and things, but the details that are there are very well moulded. Airfix has earned a bit of a reputation in recent years for designing kits with really deep panel lines, but this one isn't too bad in comparison to other kits like the Spitfire Mark I. I have been made aware though that some people might not like the light blue roundels on the wings. Whilst the lighting on my workbench does make them seem quite light, and in real life they are a little darker, it's not by much. Some might argue that it should feature dark blue roundels, but I have seen on various forums that they are depicted on this model in a faded or sun-bleached condition. Personally, I can't speak for their accuracy, and then again, there is usually a prototype for everything, which is why there is such a thing as modeler's license. I would have liked the choice of an alternative paint scheme in the box, but being a Series 1 kit from Airfix, they just don't tend to do that. Series 1 kits though, do tend to be cheaper. Speaking of, how much did I pay for this? As you can see on the box, I paid the grand total of £6.95 here in the UK a year or two ago. This was pretty much the recommended retail price at the time, being only slightly cheaper by about 4 pence in the shop that I bought it from. This seems to be an appropriate price for this particular product. At the time of making this video though, it would appear that this kit is no longer listed on the Airfix website. I'm sure stock still exists in various shops online, if you wanted to get one, you might be able to. That being said though, this kit is currently available in RAF Desert Colours as a starter set with paints and cement, or as a standard Series 1 kit in US Army Olive Drab as seen at Pearl Harbor, so options do still exist. As you probably guessed by now, this is one of the more recent toolings of models in the Airfix range. Originally introduced in 2011, it was first released in this exact paint scheme that I have built in this video. So, the kit I have here is a re-release of that original version. This tells me that it might not be too long before it makes another appearance in this scheme in the future. Other versions that you might still be able to find in shops since then are the Dogfight Double Sets, RAF Desert Starter Set and Battle of Britain P40s that I've also featured on my channel. Enough about the kit though, let's reflect on my modelling skills. Whilst I'm happy with the overall result, I have learnt a few lessons during this build. I think I've improved my airbrushing skills with the extra practice and the weathering really went well in my favour this time. Using Vallejo Liquid Mask without the white tack worms was a pain though. I'm glad I managed to fix all that flaky paint because it would have looked pretty bad if I didn't. Perhaps next time I'll see if I'm brave enough to add the aerial wires that the real aircraft had running from the wings to the tail. And there probably will be a next time, as I just don't seem to be able to stop building these kits. And with that, I think it's probably time to wrap this one up. This is a fun little kit that isn't particularly difficult to build. The overall quality is really good and it won't exactly break the bank in price. You might find that it throws up a couple of small challenges here and there, but it should result in an attractive little model. If you enjoyed this video, let me know by clicking that thumbs up and leave a comment letting me know what you think of my finished model. Have you built this kit? And do you agree with me that this is a slightly addictive model to build? If you're new here and would like to see more videos, please consider subscribing to support the channel and by clicking that notification bell, you'll never miss a new modeling video. I'd like to thank Hamish's Heinkels for his collaboration on this history segment and my patrons and channel members for their generous support. Finally, one last thank you to all of you for watching this one, and I'll see you on the workbench again next time.